This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA. basic major objectives are to follow on to the previous flights. Especially the commander of the 12 and one half day Apollo 17 mission is 38 year old Eugene Cernan from Chicago, Illinois. Cernan has already flown twice before on Gemini 9 and Apollo 10. Time to come to be written of all of our lunar exploration. We hope that uh, geologically speaking we'll uh, be able to uncover uh, rock types and uh, uh, different types of geologic finds that date back from the very beginning of the moon, the moon's history, uh, to, the, uh, to the present time. And, of course, the major objective here scientifically is to be better, better able to understand our own Earth, uh, our own evolution of, uh, of life uh, as our Earth knows it, uh, uh, our own environment, and maybe better predict uh, what has happened and what might happen in the future concerning civilization here on Earth. It's, it's difficult Exploring to the surface of the moon it's with Cernan, 37-year-old scientist astronaut so Dr. Harrison Schmidt, a geologist. Schmidt is a native of Santa Rita, New Mexico. As in any major exploration program, whether it was the exploration of the American West, or the exploration of Antarctica, or now the exploration of the moon, and, of, and the planets in general now, it's searching and expecting to find the unexpected. And that is really, almost invariably, what turns out to be the major payoff. We won't know it for 50, 100 years, but some of the things that we are finding and will find that were completely unexpected, that we didn't plan to find, will, will almost certainly be the most important things in the eyes of the history of science and very probably in the eyes of the history of man. 40-year-old Ronald Evans was born in St. Francis, Kansas. It is Evans who will carry out the orbital science experiments in the command module, while his two companions explore the lunar surface. In other words, uh, all, most all of the geologic interpretation uh, that goes on on the moon has been done from photographs. And each person that does this mapping or interpretation, uh, they do it from a photograph. The photographs uh, are not as good as they really, you know, they're not as good as the eye, let's put it that way. So each person that does it, generally uh, <coughs> ask himself uh, a lot more questions than he can really answer from what he can see down there. Hopefully I will be able to answer those questions. Five times the United States has landed astronauts on the moon. Apollo 17 will land here, an area known as Taurus Littro. This is an artist's concept of the Taurus Littro landing site. Challenging, just topographically speaking, uh, it's sort of a box canyon surrounded by mountains on three sides uh, and a, uh, a cliff that was either formed by an earthquake or by uh, lava flows or by some other means uh, uh, across the front of this canyon. Uh, we have a landslide that comes off one of the mountains on the uh, left that, uh, at least we think it's a landslide, and it uh, has some rubble that is strewn across our landing site uh, and across some of the craters uh, just in front of where we're going to land. So it's very, very challenging from a pilot point of view, and it's very interesting from a geologic point of view, uh, because uh, we hope that uh, there may be uh, up to four uh, different uh, types of materials, geologic finds you might call them, uh, from four different uh, uh, periods of the moon's history, from the very beginning to possibly the, uh, uh, what we call the present time. The view out astronaut Cernan's window as he makes the final descent for landing should look like this practice landing recorded from a simulator at the Kennedy Space Center. The first thing I'm going to see, of course, as soon as we pitch over is a, is a 7,000 foot mountain that stands right out in front of me on the, uh, almost dead ahead and another 7,000 foot mountain that's uh, off to the right out of Jack's window. Uh, 
then uh, we will not see the mountains we just came over because we will just have passed them. Uh, but across between these two mountains in front of us, there'll be uh, about a 300-foot cliff. And uh, then several craters, a landslide uh, in front of this uh, cliff that I'm describing. And uh, I'm going to be particularly looking for one large crater. It's uh, almost 2,000 feet across. And so you can get a feel how big that really is. And I want to land just short, uh, just in front of uh, that particular crater. Cernan and Schmidt will spend some three days on the moon. This includes three seven-hour EVAs. During the first near the lunar module, they will unpack and deploy the scientific instruments and unfold the lunar rover, their moon transportation. Later, they will drive out about two miles in the first field geology excursion. As part of the next seven-hour exploration, they will travel to the farthest point, almost five miles from the lunar module, and up a 300-foot cliff. The third and final exploration will take them on a strictly geology field trip in the opposite direction. All of the traverses will be televised from the moon in color. Jack Schmidt, the first scientist to travel to the moon, feels that his assignment is a logical next step. And so uh, I don't feel myself very unusual uh, in the respect of, of being a scientist because we've had specialists before. And I'm, uh, I'm really a geologist going to the moon, and we've got sci uh, other types of scientists going on the Skylab program. Uh, physicists, solar physicists, a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, and we're just gradually evolving a phase of the exploration of space where uh, we're now trying to apply specialties to the particular problems we have to deal with. And uh, in the case of exploring the far frontiers of, of, of space or, of, or of, of any geographic environment, if you will, a geologist has an advantage. It's because that's what he does. That's his livelihood, and that's what he's, he's been doing most of his life. And uh, hopefully uh, we open up with this the possibilities of applying other specialists to other problems, and which we are doing. Jack Schmidt will have an opportunity to examine the effects of the sun on a wide cross-section of lunar soil and rocks, ranging in age from very recent to samples billions of years old. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm enthusiastic about the total potential of the site to look into the two major questions, that is, understanding the Earth better through the moon and its early history, and understanding the sun better through the exposure of its soils to the sun, and then, of course, there's this other thing of the unexpected, and who knows what that's going to be. And that's really what makes it exciting. One of the new experiments Ron Evans will carry out as he circles the moon is with a radar-like device called the lunar sounder. So what do you get out of that lunar sounder, you know, other than the fact that it zaps a wave down and it comes back? How it comes back and with what frequency shifts and phase angle shifts and whatever happens in the, in a, in the radar, uh, people are able to determine what kind of rocks are down there, what kind of material is down there. Is there any water? Is there subterranean water uh, below the lunar surface? We don't know. If it's down there, the lunar sander will find it. Coming back from the moon, astronaut Evans will go outside the spacecraft. To prepare himself for this job, he practices for short periods of zero gravity in an airplane and for extended times neutrally buoyant underwater. The EVA uh, is primarily uh, designed, uh, first of all, to retrieve the film that's back in the uh, sim bay. The two cameras, the pan camera and the mapping camera, of course, have film cassettes. The lunar sounder, it, its basic information is uh, recorded on film. These uh, cassettes are in the sim bay, and of course, the only piece of the whole booster that comes back into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, it lands, is only that little uh, uh, command module up on the top. So somehow we've got to get the film cassettes back into the command module, and that's the purpose of the EVA. We asked Dr. William Finney, chief of the Manned Spacecraft Center's geology branch, to describe some of the things we're learning as a result of the moon landings. Well, one can say that the early history of the Earth is pretty well obscured by erosion and uh, various 
atmospheric and effects of water that we know exist on Earth. But on the moon, we do not have these problems to contend with. Therefore, we are seeing the, the surface features and the rocks in a state which probably has been similar since the time of the formation of the moon. Therefore, we can probably infer that the early history of the Earth was somewhat similar. However, it's been modified by the, the effects of water and atmosphere and the erosion and weathering effects that we know take place. So what we probably are able to work with in the sampling and study of the moon is a similar picture to what the early history of the Earth was like. If we can ferret out the various things that the moon is trying to tell us, it may well tell us how the planetary bodies in the solar system formed at the beginning and, and help us in the, the whole problem of planetary development. Mission 17 is the last in the Apollo series of lunar landings. We ask the crew how they look upon this final flight assignment and what Apollo means to them. What Apollo has done has taken men from the environment in which they evolved and put them in an environment that is, is orders of magnitude different than any environment that life has ever, that we know of, has ever existed. And this has to be considered an evolutionary step. I think it's, it's it, that mankind will continue that evolution, will continue to explore and challenge himself on this Earth's frontier. At the present time, we put that frontier on the moon. We are retrenching a little bit now. I do not think it's, it's for any significant amount of time. And we're going to start to do what was done in the days of the West after the mountain men and after the army explorers. We're starting to put the farmers and the miners, the practical utilizers of space, into space. What is the one thing, the one thing in the last decade that has increased the esteem of our nation, the United States, in the eyes of the rest of the world? The one thing has been our participation in the space program. The whole world looks to the United States to lead, to go their accomplishments in the space program. And to me, that's a very, very important thing. We felt certainly at Apollo 17, in spite of the fact that it were, it's the uh, last flight in the Apollo program, is really not the end, but, uh, but rather the beginning. It's, it's sort of a conclusion of the culmination of uh, what we consider man's greatest achievement, certainly uh, in our lifetime. And uh, looking in the future, these uh, achievements and the potentials of them have uh, literally no bounds. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.